Today, this morning, we have two lectures on decoding of convolutional codes. So yesterday afternoon, we, we discussed some of the properties of convolutional codes and how to encode them and a little bit about how to find their distance properties and things like this. Uh, there's two, well, there's several, there's a number of different ways of decoding convolutional codes, but there's two ways which they're both optimal in some sense. And one's a map decoder and one's a maximum likelihood decoder. And uh, we'll discuss first the maximum likelihood decoder, which is called the Viterbi algorithm. And then after the break, we'll discuss the map decoder, which is called the, uh, the BCJR algorithm, named after four different authors of a paper. But anyway, we'll start today with the Viterbi algorithm this morning. Uh, and then, of course, this afternoon you've got the lectures on information theory, which is a little bit more abstract, kind of the, the theoretical underpinnings of coding theory. So we're just going to talk about decoding an N1 code here, one information sequence. Remember I said that that's, that's kind of the common case with convolutional codes. Oftentimes, in practice, K is just equal to 1. We'll look at a our little example, it's the same example we've been using with memory two. And we'll consider a binary symmetric channel. I, I don't want to forget we're using the binary symmetric channel a lot, but actually when we start talking about uh, LDPC codes and polar codes, we'll be assuming different channel models. In particular, uh, additive white Gaussian noise channel in which the it's still binary input, just like binary symmetric channel, but the uh, we don't assume then that the demodulator makes hard decisions. We, in, in an additive white Gaussian noise channel, we take the sample value coming out of the match filter and just treat it as a real number and process, process uh, those values that way. And you can, it's more complex in terms of decoding complexity, but it's, uh, you gain a lot in terms of error performance. So if you can afford the complexity, you usually want to use soft decisions. Here, just in terms of explaining how, and that soft decisions are easy for the Viterbi algorithm, too. You just, instead of, instead of the receive sequence being bits, it's just a sequence of real numbers, which can have positive or negative values. And you consider the binary, the possible binary inputs as being plus one or minus one. And you're looking, basically, at which, at sample value outputs of the demodulator, whether they're closer to plus one or minus one in terms of their, their uh, it would be Euclidean distance in that case, just the normal way we measure distance in Euclidean space instead of Hamming distance. But just because the binary symmetric, it's easier the first time through to understand these algorithms, the Viterbi algorithm in terms of the binary symmetric channel, uh, so we'll stick with that here. So as we saw yesterday, we can represent a convolutional code by a trellis diagram. And the initial state is normally the all zero state. There are, there's something called a, I, I, I don't know whether I mentioned this in class or just to somebody uh, privately. There's something called a tail biting code that you may want to use. You, you, you notice when we, uh, when we, when we talk about convolutional codes, we have an information sequence, and then we have a few bits, M, which is the memory of the encoder, bits that we have to put at the end to get the encoder back to the all zero state. And those aren't information bits. Those are, those are bits which are chosen, if it's a feed forward encoder, they have to be zeros to get you back to the all zero state. So th that means that the true rate of the code, if you what has, those have to be transmitted, uh, is actually a little bit less than the nominal rate that we defined. So instead of one half, it may be a little less than one half, depending on how long the input sequence is. And sometimes this rate loss, particularly if, if you're not sending long sequences, is a problem. So people can use what's called a tail biting convolutional code, where you, you don't terminate the encoder with extra input bits, which are not information bits. But in, so you have no rate loss in that case. But in, in that case, what you have to do 
is you have to decide, you have to look at your input sequence ahead of time and do a calculation, determine which, you still have to, uh, in applying the Viterbi algorithm, you have to start and stop in the same state. So you have to calculate, starting out based on your information sequence, which state you start in to guarantee that with that information sequence you'll wind up in the same state. So that's a big, a lot of words to say that you don't always start in the all zero state, but so, most of the time you do, because most of the time you're not doing this tail biting. If you're sending long sequences, these few extra bits to terminate don't, don't hurt you much. They, they cost you very little in rate. We'll see this with, with convolutional low density parity check codes too. There's always this issue with convolutional codes of a few extra bits which you lose a little bit in rate. And for that reason, they're, they're often, we often assume long sequences so we can kind of ignore that issue. So the way the, this trellis diagram looks, as we, as we start through the trellis, and we'll see a picture here in a minute, uh, each, each information bit we, so we start out in a single state, the all zero state. And then each information bit doubles the number of states up until time m. And then once we get to time m, we've got two to the m state. We, we, we've got two to the m states in the trellis diagram. Uh, one information bit enters the encoder at each time unit. So there's two branches leaving each state. Okay, because it's just, what, you're in a state, you have an information bit coming in, depending on if it's a one or a zero, you can go to one of two other states. This is why it, if you want, this is why it's a little more difficult to use the Viterbi algorithm and the BCGR algorithm, which is based on a trellis, if you're using high rate convolutional encoders. For example, if you wanted to use rate eight ninths, well, then there, at each time instant, there's eight information bits coming in. So there'd be 256 branches leaving each state in the trellis. It increases the trellis complexity to use high rate encoders. So these are very convenient for low rate codes, particularly k equal 1, k equal 2, maybe k equal 3. But for high rate, the complexity uh, becomes difficult. There's some things you can do to go get around that by trying to decode on something called the de decoding on something called the dual trellis. Okay, but but in any case, uh, in our example here, we're just considering k equal one, as I said, and then in that case, you have two branches leaving each state of the t state diagram. Now, once you get beyond time unit m. There's, there's two branches mer that merge into each state. We'll see this when we see the picture in a minute. Uh, so each state has two branches coming in, as well as two branches coming out. In the first part of the trellis, the first m bits, there's only one branch coming into each state. It's unique. There's a unique path to each state. So, and I think I mentioned this before, the encoding of an information sequence is equivalent to tracing a path through the trellis. So each information sequence corresponds to a unique path through the trellis. So here, here's a trellis, uh, and we see that we start in the all zero state, okay, and m is two here, so up until level two, notice that we have just one branch entering each state, okay. Once we get beyond level two, we have two branches entering each state. We always have two branches leaving each state because the input can be either a zero or a one. Okay. And the, the, uh, uh, the transition here points to the next state that we get to. I mean, remember the state diagram that we had, uh, given the particular input that corresponds to this branch. Now this is this trellis continues on in time, and we'll see when we finish this example that it starts at a particular state here, and then once the information sequence is finished, it collapses back to that same state. So we'll see a picture of the full trellis here in a minute. So the encoder, after we have an L-bit information uh, uh, sequence, we return the encoder to the all-zero state. I guess this should have been the word state. 
And if it's a feed-forward encoder, as we've said, we do that by feeding in M zeros into the encoder. It pushes us back to the all zero state. If it's a feedback encoder, like we saw, we have some other sequence that we have to put in to get it back to the zero state. But it's a unique sequence, and it's, it can't just be arbitrary, or it won't put us back to the zero state. That's why these termination bits are not information bits. And they don't, they don't contribute to the rate of the code. Now, during this termination process, the number of states is reduced by half. So in the beginning part, the number of states was doubling each time we went one further section into the trellis. Once we get to the information, the end of the information sequence, and we start this termination process, then the number of states is cut in half each time. Okay, because in the termination process, there's only one branch leaving each state because there's only one input bit possible. Okay, we ha in the termination process, we have to use the input bit that's going to get us back to the zero state. So there's not two choices anymore. Uh, so for uh, in the beginning, back here talking about the beginning, there's exactly one path of length L e entering each node. Uh, at time L. And that we kind of saw here, we pointed this out, in the first two stages, M is equal to 2 here, there's just one path entering each state. Okay, and, and for, uh, for larger values of M though, there's, exact, there's 2 to the L minus M paths of length L entering each state or each node at time L. So we can see that, for example, our little example, m is equal to 2. So for l equal to 3, that would say at level 3, there's got to be 2 to the l minus m, which is 2 to the l is 3, m is 2. So that's 2. It says there's two paths entering each state at the third level. Well, for this state, that would be this path and this path. Those are the two paths that get that, that could get us to this state at level 3. Okay, and for this state, we could get there by this path, or we could get there by this path. Okay, those are the two ways we can get to this state at level 3. Okay. At level 4, there's four ways of getting to each state. So here we could get there, we could go this way, we could go... Uh, this way, we could go this way, and we could go this way. Four ways of getting to this state. Okay, so as you go through the trellis, the, the number of paths entering a particular state doubles at each stage. And there's a total of 2 to the L paths of length L. So again, at level L, there's 2 to the L minus M paths to each state. There's 2 to the M states. So 2 to the L minus M times 2 to the M gives us 2 to the L total paths that can get us to uh, a, some state at level L. So at the fourth level here, there's 16 paths possible code sequences starting here that can get to some state at level 4. And it just doubles each time. In general, for if the information sequence is capital L, there's two to the capital L sequences that can take you from one end of the trellis to the other. And our job is to find the one that's, the job of the decoder is to find the one that's most likely to have been the actual transmitted code word. Which, for the binary symmetric channel, I can say this here, is, is again going to be using exactly the same arguments that we use for block codes. It's going to be the path through the trellis which is closest to the received sequence in terms of Hamming distance. As the minimum Hamming distance to the received sequence, that's going to be the maximum likelihood path through the trellis of all the two to the capital L possible paths. Question is how do we find that path 
that closest path in an efficient manner. Okay, for example, if capital L is 100, it's not a long information sequence by any stretch of the imagination. They could be a million or something. But even 100, you'd have two to the hundredth paths through that trellis. And if you just compared each path one by one to the received sequence and calculated the Hamming distance, okay, so if capital L were 100 with this code, there's two bits on each branch, and you've got, when you get to the end, you've got two additional sections for the termination. So you'd have actually 102 sections, and you'd have two bits on each branch, code bits on each branch. So your code length would be 204. Your rate, by the way, would be 100 divided by 204, and it's slightly less than a half because of this, these termination bits. But you'd have... So you'd have two to the 100th code words, each of length 204. And your receive sequence would be on a binary symmetric channel, would be a binary sequence of length 204. And you'd have to compare that, if you just did brute force, compare that receive sequence to each of the two to the 100th code words, possible code words, possible paths through the trellis, compute the Hamming distance for each one, and then uh, select the one as your estimate, your maximum likelihood estimate, which is closest to the received sequence in terms of Hamming distance. So that sounds like a lot of work, two to the 100th comparison. So the Viterbi algorithm is just an efficient way of doing this, where you do far less computation and still guarantee yourself to get the maximum likelihood code work. So, uh, again, the, the information, see, I, maybe I've said some of this already, it's of length L, we're assuming it's encoded into a code sequence of length N equal L plus M times N, and if this is 100 and this is 2 and this is 2, that's where we get the 204 I was just talking about. So this is the, this is the code, this is a code sequence then corresponding to a particular information sequence. And the receive sequence then would be of this same length, also of length 204, if we want to stick with that example. And each of these sub-blocks in the receive sequence is an n-bit block, two in our case. Two bits corresponding to each time unit, two bits on each branch of the trellis. N bits in general. And again, a maximum likelihood decoder finds a path through the trellis that maximizes the con the conditional probability. Otherwise, uh, you receive R, you want to compute the probability of R given V for every V, possible V, 2 to the 100th in our case, and which one gives the largest value of this probability. Okay, that's your maximum likelihood decision. And this, this conditional probability can be written since the channel is memoryless, there's a total of L plus M time units, and each time unit is associated with a conditional probability of receiving the, in our case, two bits on that at that time, given two bits on, the, on some corresponding code sequence at the same time. Okay, so this is this is still a joint probability of n bit vectors, n being two in our case. But this, in turn, can be written as the product of individual conditional probabilities for the individual bits. There's n bits on a branch, and we have a probability of that of one of those received bits given the corresponding code bit, and we multiply, we would multiply those conditional probabilities together uh, to get the uh, these bit. These are referred to as bit conditional probabilities. We'd multiply them together to get the branch conditional probabilities, which then we multiply together to get the path conditional probability. Or you could write this as just one big product, where you have the path probability is the product of all the uh, condition, bit conditional probabilities along the path. The important thing is these bit conditional probabilities are the 
epsilons and 1 minus epsilons in the binary symmetric channel model. If, if this is equal to this, this, is, this probability is 1 minus epsilon. If this is not equal to this, the probability is epsilon. So we again get, by looking, by choosing our metric to be the log of this probability, uh, we get, instead of the product of all these bit probabilities, we get the sum of the logs. The log of the product is the sum of the logs. So we get, uh, again, if we want to start with the branch metrics, our overall path metric would be the sum of the logs of the branch conditional probabilities, uh, which we could call branch metrics. And then each branch metric would be the sum of the logs of the bit conditional probabilities, which we could call bit metrics. So again, there's a little bit of terminology here. It's just you have, you have branch conditional probabilities. The logs of those are the what we call branch metrics. You have bit conditional probabilities. The logs of those are what we call bit metrics. Okay. And basically, the sum of the bit metrics over an entire path is what, uh, is what we want to maximize. And for the same reason, the, 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 the log, so we're going to get we're going to get log of epsilon raised to the d power plus the log of 1 minus epsilon raised to the n minus d power, just like we did with block codes. Otherwise, we get for the, for the d positions where the two paths differ, those probabilities are epsilon. So in our metric, we get log of epsilon. And for the other n minus d positions where the received sequence agrees with the path, we get the log of 1 minus epsilon. So our, our overall path metric becomes d times the log of epsilon plus n minus d times the log of 1 minus epsilon, which is exactly the expression we had for block codes, OK? Uh, because here we're just we're treating this like a block code, in a sense. We've got this, this big trellis with 2 to the 100th code words, and they have, all have length n equal to 204, so in the example I've given. So it's exactly the same thing, and the maximum likelihood decision rule then is to choose the, try to find the path with the smallest distance. Now, for the Viter and again, the Viterbi algorithm is a way, is an efficient way of searching the trellis to do this where you don't have to do so many computations. And if I remember at the end, I hope I remember at the end to, to comp we were talking about having to do two to the 100th computations comparisons. Uh, at the end, when we finish the example, we'll try to compute the number for this little example that we get, that we have to do using the Viterbi algorithm. OK, so the partial path metric for the first J branches, now th this is something, if we were just doing the kind of blind decoding like I talked about, we, we wouldn't care about this. Okay, we just get the path metric for every path, and Find the one that's the best, and that's our answer. In the Viterbi algorithm, we have to deal with something called path metric, a partial path metric, which is just the metric for the first J branches. So we're adding these bit metrics up to through the up until time J, and that's called a partial path metric for the first J branch in the trellis. And again, this is this is Finally, then, what we say that the decoding rule is, is we want to find the code sequence V that minimizes the hem hemming distance between, between R and V. And it's a computationally efficient way of doing this. So the Viterbi alg algorithm kind of proceeds from left to right through the trellis and makes some partial calculations along the way and uh, stores certain information, as we'll see. And at the end, is able to make a decision as to what the most likely code word is. So what the, what the decoder has to compute uh, as it moves along is partial path metrics. So we saw we've got two branches entering each state. So at a given state, we're going to be comp uh, comparing the partial path metric of the 
two paths entering uh, that state. And we're going to be comparing them and then selecting. This is the, the operation here is called add, compare, select, because in order to compute the partial path metric at a given state, you, you have to, you, we'll see this in a second, you have to take the previously stored partial path metric, add to that the branch metric that gets you from the previous state to the current state. So that's an add. And then you have to do a comparison. You do this for the two paths entering a state. Compare them. Pick the best one, which in our case is pick the one with the smallest Hamming distance. And then you have to uh, select, which means, uh, well, I, I guess I said both compare and select at the same time. You compare them, and then you select the better one. And what do I mean by select? We'll see in a second. You, we have to store it. The other one you can forget about. You don't have to store. So we store part the partial path metric entering each state with the best metric, which would be the minimum distance. And we call that the survivor. All other partial paths are eliminated. Now again, when we have just two branches leaving each state, we have one that's two branches entering each state. We have one that survives and one that's eliminated. You know, if we had a bigger k, like if k was equal to 2, we'd have four branches entering each state. One would survive, the other three would be eliminated. Eliminated means you don't have to store them. You don't have to store their, their metrics. So for, for once we get to level m, where we had the four states, 2 to the m states, uh, until we get to level l, there's two to the m, in the, in the entire middle part of the trellis, there's two to the m states. And so we're always going to have two to the m survivors. Now we're going to have to store these survivors. And we're going to have to store their metrics. And that's why m can't be too big. Okay, because if m is 10, even 10, you're talking about 1,024 different storage locations. In each storage location, you've got to store a path, which could be quite long. A bit sequence, would be, which could be quite long, along with a, if L is large, along with a metric, a distance. So this is most practical. I mean, there, there, are, implement, there are implementations of the Viterbi algorithm that go up to as high as M equal 13. There have been decoders built. I don't know of any bigger than that. But this was for a, a specialized deep space application uh, where they actually developed a Viterbi decoder with two to the 13th states. OK, but it, it gets it, its primary use is for decoding short constraint length convolutional codes. Now, I said earlier that. The constraint length is a measure of the uh, the strength of a code. Come, a convolutional code comes from its constraint length. So by saying that we're limiting ourselves to short constraint lengths, we're saying that we, we're not allowing ourselves to use the most powerful codes. Okay, and at least not with the Viterbi algorithm. If we want to use larger constraint lengths, there are other ways that we can decode. Sequential decoding is one way. Uh, but they're suboptimal, OK? But the, the bigger reason why the Viterbi algorithm is so popular, even though it's used to decode codes which are far from optimum, because m has to be small, is that it's often, it's often used in combination in a concatenated system, where there's a second code, which is more powerful, used in combination with the the short constraint length convolutional code. Uh, in, in, in a lot of sp uh, space and satellite standards, at least the early ones, commonly used a short constraint length convolutional code, maybe m equals 6. And then they used a, uh, a non-binary algebraic based Reed-Solomon code, same kind of codes that are used in compact disks, actually, but much bigger ones as a so-called outer code. 
to help clean up errors that the inner code, the convolutional code, couldn't correct. And that combination, I think I mentioned the other day, this idea of concatenation, you can, you can get the effect of a very powerful code by combining two uh, simpler codes. And that idea of concatenation allowed these, this kind of Viterbi decoding of convolutional codes to be very practical and used in a lot of real systems. Another big advantage of this is, as I briefly mentioned earlier, you, you can use, this is easy to adapt to soft decisions. A lot of algebraically based codes like BCH codes or Reed-Solomon codes or Reed-Muller codes, things like this, they, they work well with hard decisions, but to try to use soft decisions where you get better performance can become quite complex with these codes. With the Viterbi decoding of convolutional codes, it's quite easy to use soft decisions. We're not showing that example here for the reason I mentioned, but it's easy to do, yeah. Yeah, 2 dB. <laughs> Yeah, it's 2 to 3 dB. So you can theoretically calculate the improvement in performance that you get between making hard decisions and making pure soft decisions, no quantization at all. And uh, it, it, it ranges between 2 and 3 dB depending on the rate. Uh, so you can, you can get the same performance with 2 to 3 dB less signal power. So it's, it's significant when you're talking about at, at, you know, with uncoded BPSK, say, you, you need 9.6 dB, and channel capacity, say, if you're operating, if you want to use a rate one-half code, is about 0 0.2 dB. So your total amount of possible gain is 9.4 dB. So a couple, 2 to 3 dB is a fairly big deal. It's 20, 30 percent of the total gain that you could get. So there's a, from a performance standpoint, there's a real interest in using soft decisions, and that's, again, one of the reasons this algorithm proved to be so popular. Uh, the, you couldn't use powerful codes with it, but you could compensate for that by using concatenation. So uh, the number of survivors decreases when, once we get to time L, we're almost at the end. We just have these additional M time units where the trellis collapses to the all zero state, the termination process. And in the termination process, remember the, the number of states j is cut in half at each time. So there's fewer states, which means fewer survivors. And when you get to the end, there's only one state left and only one survivor. And the, the so you have only one path left stored in memory, and that must be the maximum likelihood path uh, if you follow the Viterbi algorithm. We'll say why that, the argument as to why that's true is fairly easy to see. So here are the steps. We, we start at level M, uh, two, 2 in our case, level 2. Compute the, remember, up to that level, there's just one path entering each state. So we compute the partial metric for that path entering each state at level M. And we store the path. There's only one, so we store it. And we store the corresponding metric. And again, our metrics here, we're just going to, we're, ju we're just, it's the Hamming distance. That's, that's what determines the most likely path. Step two, well, we increase L by one. And then we're going to compute the partial metric of all the paths entering at the next level. So it's, in our case, it's just going to be two paths. And we do that. This is the add part. We add the branch metric uh, entering that state to the metric of the survivor at the, at the previous level, which connects to this state. So we had a, we had a metric stored at the previous level for, the, for a particular state which connects to the state we're processing now. We take that metric, we add to it the branch metric for the connecting branch to get the partial path metric for this next state. We do that for both of the paths entering that state, 
We store the survivor, the one with the better metric, and uh, we also store the metric. That's it. That's the algorithm. You just go right through to the end. Uh, and when you're at the end, you have only one survivor left, and that's the maximum likelihood path. So again, the words are harder to follow. You'll see that this is pretty simple when we get into the example. So we've got, here's our, our famous encoder. Now we're going to do it just with L equal 5, just you know, not to take too long working an example. Here there's, there's actually only 32 code words, so you could say for this type of thing it wouldn't be so hard just to compare the 32 code words to the received sequence. Uh, so this is what the trellis looks like. Here's the collapsing part, which we didn't show earlier. Because at this point, we're just putting zeros into the encoder to force us back to the zero state. So there's only, notice there's only one branch leaving each state here. There's two, still, still two entering each state, but only one leaving. And the information bits on these paths are are the, the input bits on these branches are not information bits, okay? Because they're not they're not allowed to be in in this case they have to be zeros they can't be ones, so these are kind of the extra bits that cause that rate loss that we get with the termination. Again, this is not a big deal if L is large, which it normally is. Now, the way I drew the trellis here, you'll notice the way, we, the way we did it yesterday, we labeled each branch with an input bit and the two output bits. Here I'm just labeling with the two output bits. And it's, it's to, do, to do the Viterbi algorithm, this is all you need. You don't need to know what the input bits are. Uh, except at the end, you do, because what you're, the, the path that you decode, you need to know what the input bits are are corresponding to that path because that's what you're really trying to decode is the information bits. But this trellis can always be drawn in such a way that the, of the two branches leaving any state, the upper branch corresponds to an input of one and the lower branch corresponds to an input of zero. And that's the way this trellis has been drawn. So I know that like here, Leaving this state, this transition is caused by an input of 1. This one is caused by an input of 0. So when we're done and we find our path, we're going to know the sequence of information bits, 1s and zeros that correspond to that path. So the first step was to, to look up to level m and compute the four distances for the for the paths entering the four states at level M. Now, okay, oh, here's our receive sequence. Okay. So this is just our assumed receive sequence that we're trying to decode. By the way, we can see right away it's not a code word because it starts with 0, 1, and any valid code word would have to start either with 0, 0, or 1, 1. So we can see right away it's not a code word. Uh, so let, let me try to remember this. It's 0, 1, 1, 1, the first, the first two uh, branches. So it's 0, 1 in, in the first time unit. So the distance between that and this branch label is 1. I'll write it up here above the state. And the distance between 0, 1 and this branch label is also 1. So we write a 1 here. Okay. Now, here we have 0, 0, and our received was 1, 1. So we have a distance of 2 here. So we take the 2, add it to the 1 to get 3. OK. Here, what's on this branch is 1, 1. Our received is 1, 1. No additional distance. So our accumulated distance here is still 1. Here, each of these, whoops, each of these branches has distance 1 from the two bits received at this time. So that gives us 1 plus 1 or 2 here, and 1 plus 1 or 2 here. So kind of at the starting point here, we have our four states with these partial metrics so far. 
if you wanted to say at this point what looks like the most likely first two bits, you would say it would be these two. Okay, we'll see if that turns out to be the case when we're finished. So this is just that calculation. Now, the, at the next level, we, we start where we, the, the situation where we have two branches leaving each state, or entering each state. So let's start up here. And we have the third uh, branch of the receive sequence was one zero. Well, that's distance two from zero one. So the accumulated metric here would be two plus two or four if, we're, if we follow this path. Uh, one zero, however, agrees with this label branch label, so there's no additional distance, so 1 plus 0 is 1. So 1 is a smaller distance than 4, so this, this branch survives, this path survives, and this one doesn't. So we indicate this by putting an x here, that this is eliminated. So what we store for this state is this path, which would be 0, 1, 1 in terms of information bits, and the associated metric one. Okay, and then for this state, it's the operation is exactly the same. We, in comparing, we have the two branches entering here. One of them is zero zero, the other one is one one. What's received here is one zero. So each of these branch metrics is one. Adds one to the distance. This distance was two. This distance was 3. So we get now 3 from here and 4 from here. So this one's eliminated. This is the smaller distance that survives with distance 3. Same thing here. Uh, the, this is 1, 0. That's two agreements. And this one is 0, 1. That's two disagreements. So the distance here goes from 1 to 3. The distance here stays at 2, so this is the survivor, this is eliminated. And finally, at the zero state, again, each branch picks up distance 1. So we have this one now accumulates to 4, this one only 3, so this one survives and this one's eliminated. So once we've gone through the processing at time unit 3, at level 3, we have four, we, we, we have to have four memory locations in storage, each one storing a path, which would be whatever path is not, has not been eliminated so far, and each one, and storing the associated metric. So we can go to the next, to the next level. We move to the next level. Now, one of the things that can happen, I'm not going to go through all of these. It's, it's repetitive. W one of the things that can happen, look what happens here. The fourth received branch is 1, 0. That's uh, two agreements here, so the distance 3 stays at 3. Here we have two disagreements, so the distance 1 is increased to 3, and we have a tie. Okay. What do we do in the way when we have a tie? Well, it doesn't matter. Practically, you're not going to, you could store, you could say, well, let's store both of them. And then at the end, you could put out two. Uh, if, if, if the surviving path goes through this point, you could say, well, I'll list both of those as possible code words. They both have the same like, likelihood of having occurred. But in practice, you wouldn't want to do that because you just got to, you know, you don't want to have a, variable number of storage locations. So you just pick one arbitrarily. You've got a 50% chance of being right. You may say, well, that's, that doesn't sound good. But the chances of ties, uh, any path that would go through a state where you have a tie, the chances of that <coughs> in the end being the maximum likelihood path are very small unless you have a very noisy channel. If you have a very noisy channel, you're likely to make an error in any case, some error in any case. The other point about this is if you're using soft decisions, you don't have ties. 
Okay, depending on the precision you assign to your, to your uh, match filter outputs. But you're not going to have ties. So it's not, it's not really an issue in practice. And then we, we continue on, do the same thing at the next level. Now when we get to the, <coughs> we had another tie here, I guess, and another one here, and another one here. So with short trellises, small trellises like this, it's, you can get a lot of ties. Uh, here now we are collapsing to two states, and we had the received branch at level 6 is 1, 1. So we get distance 1 on each of these branch metrics. And so this one's going to survive because this one was 4. So this goes up to 2, and this is eliminated. And between these two, uh, you get distance 2 here. That's going to get this up to 5. These two agree, but that's going to stay at 4, and that's going to survive. Okay. And then when you go to the end, you're going to get the last two bits are one zero. You have one added to each. Okay, and this is going to go to five, and this is going to go to three. So this survives, and this is eliminated. So when you're at the end, you've got only one path left. You can trace back. You just you go back through the trellis. Now you'll in in practice you would have that stored, and you just read it out. Now, however, in if these sequences are very long, you may not want to store the whole thing. And there's, there's various methods that you can trace back and find the correct path through the trellis, or the estimated path, hopefully correct, presumably correct. But just looking at this example, we just go back and we never go through an X. Okay, so it would be this path. And in fact, the one that started out best did wind up best in this case, which is probably going to happen when you have a short example like this, not necessarily if you have a longer one. Any question on how the algorithm works before we say why it's maximum likelihood? So the operation, it's this, at each state, you, do, you have this pre-processing over here for the initial 2 to the m states, and then starting at level m plus 1, at each state you have an add, compare, select operation. Same operation. And you store a path and a metric for each state. And you don't have to remember the past metrics. Otherwise, when you, do, when you get your uh, correct path here, say, or your survivor here, you can just write over what your survivor was here. You don't have to store that. Although, if you don't want to store entire paths, sometimes with this traceback method, you do keep in storage previous surviving states. But these are details of implementation. Is there any question on how this works? Pardon? Yeah, if you don't have flushing zeros, you would, what would the logical thing to do, you stop here and you'd say, all right, well, uh, it's going to have it's going to be one of the four survivors here this one looks best at this time so let me pick this one in this case you'd be right i mean that is the surviving path but you're not guaranteed to be right you could have the lowest metric here could accumulate more distance than the final two branches than one of the other survivors so that can happen so you you can certainly stop here and decode with what looks like the best survivor, but you're not guaranteed to have the maximum likelihood path in that case. Now you could say if, this, if the metric here was at least four bigger than any of the others, which is not the case here, uh, you could say, well, the others wouldn't, couldn't possibly catch up, you know, that kind of thing. But you don't, uh, again, the, uh, usually these codes are used with very long sequences, and the memory is fairly short. 
so this rate loss or termination is usually not a big deal. And you guarantee yourself the maximum likely path that way. Now why, okay, why is it, how do we know it's maximum likelihood? We, we, we saw the algorithm, we saw it works, it's very simple. It's, it's kind of an argument by contradiction. Let's, let's pick, uh, let's say, for example, let me pick one of the paths that was eliminated and, and propose, say that, that, argue that that was the maximum likelihood path. And then I'll argue that that can't possibly be the case. So let's, let's take this path. Okay, we go up, down, up, down. This was this branch was eliminated, and then up, up down, down. Let, let's. I want to say, well, how come this path? And you can make the same argument for every path. Okay. Every path that isn't the isn't the final survivor. Uh, how how come this path couldn't have a better metric than the final survivor? Well, let me, let, let's look at it this way. Uh, up to this point, this path was worse than this path, which actually is the final survivor, because it got eliminated. Okay, at this point, this path had mem had, uh, distance 5, and this path, no, what's, why does something look funny here? So that's 5 and this one. Yeah, but this was 3, oh. Oh, this should have just been 1. Because it's a 1, 0 here, and 1, 0 here. This distance was zero. This is a, a typo. This should have been one. Okay. So at this point, this path had distance five, actually, and this one had only distance one. So at this point, this path was better. Now, if you want to argue that this path is maximum likelihood, I could turn around and say, well, okay, but from here on, we can take... Okay, the, the path we, we talked about was this one. But from here on, this one can go the same way. So the, the distance, whoops, the additional distance that these two paths would pick up from the received sequence from this point on would be exactly the same. So if this one was better at this point, it, it would have to be better by the end. So any path that loses a comparison anywhere along the way cannot wind up being the best path. Because from that point on, it's the same as the path that beat it. And so the path that beat it would be better at the end. So no path that is eliminated can possibly be the maximum likelihood path. Every path is eliminated by the end of the algorithm except one. So that must be the maximum likelihood path. That's the proof. Actually, you can write a proof of this maximum likelihood property of this algorithm just with words. You don't even need any equation. So it's guaranteed to be maximum likelihood, which is, again, for a lot of, a lot of block codes, it's very difficult, unless they're short block codes, it's very difficult to find maximum likelihood decoding algorithms. Uh, most of the decoding algorithms are what they call bounded distance decoding algorithms, which means you're guaranteed to be able to correct up to the minimum distance minus one divided by two, that number of errors. But that's, that's still somewhat short of maximum likelihood performance. And nice thing about the Viterbi algorithm, even though the codes that it can decode in practice are not the strongest codes, there's a simple mechanism for doing maximum likelihood decoding. So I think this is the last slide. Uh, is then this, so this, this trellis, that uh, we get the one back up here, uh, is just, it's got all the eliminated branches removed, and you can see there's only one way of getting back here. 
okay, from the, from the final state. And that's our decoded path. So our decoded information sequence would be 0, 1, remember up branches are 1s, 1, 0, 1. These are two zeros are not information bits. The decoded information sequence would be 5 bits because L was equal to 5. Now what about, what about computation here? I mean, let's go back to the L equal 100 example, okay? So we said if we were going to do this brute force, we'd have to make 2 to the 100th comparisons between paths of length 204. Here, what you do is you, per time unit, you make four comparisons. And the paths are, in general, shorter. They're partial paths, but let's not worry about that. Let's just say we make four comparisons of distance at each time unit. And if we're doing 100 time units, we're basically making 400 comparisons. It would be slightly less than that. I guess it would be 397 or something like that. So we'd be making 400 comparisons of paths comparing their distances in this algorithm to decode a, a sequence of length 100. Whereas you do 2 to the 100th comparisons if you're going to do it brute force. So you can see this adds, reduces the complexity of maximum likelihood decoding by a huge amount. And this is, this is the type of thing that's missing from, from uh, most of the good block codes is that you can always do this brute force comparison, two to the k code words, compare them to the received sequence and calculate all your distances. But to find an algorithm which will uh, much, do much less computation and still guarantee that you've got the maximum likelihood code word is none of the practice uh, Block codes used in practice have this capability. Uh, th I, there are some very limited uh, Hamming codes, for example, which are just single error correcting and some, some specialized codes. But in general, the bigger ones would not. OK, so this is one advantage of the, of the convolutional codes uh, is you get true with Viterbi decoding. You get true maximum likelihood decoding. Another advantage is you can use the soft decisions easily. All, the only difference is really no difference except that the metrics are now real numbers and you have to, you have to uh, accumulate real numbers instead of distances. I mean, you can get some numerical issues with that, but you can scale and stuff like that. It's not, it's easy, it's not hard to do. Okay, are there any questions on this? Yeah. Take the best uh, five magnetic weak states, and I don't know this time. So, how much is the possibility of performance? If I go to this time, so at each state out of the four uh, stages, I took take which whichever five magnetic is the less, least. And I think you mean you'd you so you'd you'd propose your decoding algorithm, <laughs> which would okay, which would. Uh, no, that's fine. Which would say, all right, you do this, and then you say, all right, uh, because this is the lowest state metric, I'm going to assume that the bit on this branch was a zero. Yeah. And then you'd go over here, and because this is the lowest state metric, I'm going to assume that this branch was a zero. Okay. I mean, you can do that. You can do, I mean, that would be. One, one issue with it I think you can see right away is you're not guaranteed to get a, a complete path through the tree, through the trellis, which means it wouldn't be a code word. You would ha have to have some errors in it. But it may not be bad. I mean, it may be fairly close. I mean, even the maximum likelihood path can have errors. I mean, it, if, if the channel's very noisy, you could be closer to an incorrect code word than you are to a correct code word. I mean, you could do that, but it's just, it's, it's uh, for one thing, you wouldn't be guaranteed to, correct, to, to decode to a code word. I think that would be the biggest problem with it. 
So the difference in the next lecture is that here we're, we're finding the path through the trellis which maximizes or minimizes the distance between the receive sequence and a particular code word or path through the trellis. The, the BCGR algorithm is designed to minimize the bit error probability of every bit, every information bit in, the, uh, in, in a particular code word. And that doesn't all, now it, it's exactly the same as this if all code words are equally likely. But in the case when some code words are, not e are more likely than others, then finding the most likely path is not necessarily going to, like this algorithm would do, it's not necessarily going to minimize bit error probability. So there you'd need to use the, the BCGR algorithm.